So there are some principles that are good to, to be thinking about and be mindful of when we talk about timeout. One thing is that timeout is shorthand. A lot of people, parents don't know this. Timeout, the actual technical term, is timeout from positive reinforcement. That's part of the term. So it's not timeout if it's not from positive reinforcement. And that's really important because if your typical environment is not very reinforcing, what is, timeout's no different. It's the same thing, right? It's also important to, to think, and this just came up in the discussion here. In fact, maybe, uh, maybe my work's done. <laughs> you guys came up with lots of good ideas. Uh, timeout isn't a one-shot approach. Timeout is actually a collection of, it's part of a collection of interventions, or it's a collection of tools in a toolbox that are used to get the best out of the kids we work with. It's not just a, a standalone intervention. Just like timeout is timeout from positive reinforcement, it's important to make sure that timeout isn't reinforcing. So the example that you gave was a very good one. If it allows me to get out of something I don't want to do, timeout's great. That's a reward for me. Even though the adults might think it's a good intervention uh, is a, a negative consequence. Someone had mentioned this earlier that you don't want to be giving lots and lots and lots of timeouts. In fact, the way you know timeout is working is that you don't have to use it very often. If you have a timeout program in place, you don't, want to, you don't want that to be your most commonly used behavioral intervention for kids with ADHD. If it is, you know you're doing something wrong because that means that timeout should suppress behavior. It should keep you from doing bad things. That's, that's why we have, that's what jails are, right? That, those are extreme examples of timeout. If we had our whole population in jails, then that tells us something, that the, the current approach is not effective, that, that, that time, time in is not rewarding enough to try to avoid that sort of situation. And we also know that planning ahead is gonna be real important for timeout. I'm gonna talk about that in a moment as well. So we know that timeout should be, time in should be positive and reinforcing. The effectiveness of timeout's probably going to be directly related to how reinforcing that environment is. So there's a couple of examples up here. If a child's in free play at recess time at school, versus an after-school program where they're supposed to be doing homework, where's timeout gonna be more likely to suppress negative behaviors? It's easy, right? Free play. They're gonna to wanna to stay in that. They might not care as much if they're gonna get uh, sent to timeout when they have to do their homework, which they're not that invested in doing right now anyways. Same thing can happen at home. If, you, if it's timeout while chores are going on versus when you're supposed to be swimming in your swimming pool, which one's gonna work better? Of course, right? The swimming pool is much more fun. Chores aren't as fun. Timeouts is likely to be a little less effective during those types of situations. There, there's a, an overall question in the field is, should we be teaching parents time in strategies? So remember when I talked about Connie Hamp's approach where she had the child directed strategies first and um, would teach parents how to catch their kid being good and you know, be good behavioral descriptors of what the kids are doing during play activities. And you play in activities that are non-demanding. You know, it's free play stuff. I'm not asking you to do a whole bunch of things. And then once that is really buzzing and humming and working well, then we're gonna move to uh, more parent-directed activities where I'm gonna be putting demands on you and asking you to do things. Most parenting programs are set up so that we do the positive things first and then we do the negative things second. There's not a whole lot of evidence, though, about which way is the best way, whether or not you should do the positive stuff first or the negative stuff first. There's one study that has been done a little while ago now, it was done here in Florida, that suggested teaching time out first resulted in better outcomes uh, relative to the more child-directed interaction strategies first. And uh, it's kind of interesting. You, this was with children with conduct problems. So one thing to think about might be that these were children that were exhibiting severe levels of aggressive or disruptive or very serious behaviors, and parents wanted an action-oriented strategy they could use right away to reduce those problematic behaviors. And, and when they got that, that helped, and they stuck with the rest of the program, and, and it paid off. It could be if a parent's coming in in crisis, and you're telling them that they need to spend a lot of time spending the positive time with kids and, and learning how to catch them being good, that that takes too long and doesn't solve their primary problem, and so they don't do as well in parent training. But I also think it's fair to say that the evidence isn't really strong either way. There's not a whole lot of studies that teach us to do these things, and so um, all these strategies are important, and it probably depends on your particular clinical situation to figure out if this is a parent who's kind of weak in the 
positive strategies and is really critical or maybe using a lot of punishment type strategies. Maybe you would try to teach the positive things first to change that part of the environment. But, but we're not really sure. If you go with most of the manualized programs, which have been evaluated in research studies, they teach the child directed interventions first and they teach the parent directed interventions second. So that's all, that may be a best bet to go with what has been previously done and previously evaluated. We also know that uh, you, you can think about timeout as part of an orchestra, right? If you have a conductor at the orchestra and you know they have the brass and they have the woodwinds and they have all of the things, timeout is one of those groups. But all of these other things have to be happening to have a really good tune, right? Otherwise, you're just playing one note and it's not that enjoyable to listen to. So timeout, part of, timeout is part of also planning ahead, using effective instructions and commands if you're a parent or teacher, uh, using uh, good ignoring strategies. So, you know, you can't reprimand or comment on every single behavior a child with ADHD does or you would never do anything but that, right? You would be constantly commenting on things and so you might decide to choose your battles, you know, and I'm not going to worry about the fidgeting or comment on that, I'm just going to ignore that. I might, un they might roll their eyes or complain every once in a while, I'm just going to ignore that and I'm going to focus on the big ticket items like aggression and getting their work done in school because they got to they pass this grade and those are the things I'm going to devote attention to. Upfront rule setting, routines, and structure is also a good part of any behavior management program. And so if you have all that in place, it's going to make your timeouts work more effectively because it's within the context of a, of a standard program. People who use timeout also find differential attention to alternative behavior to be a good thing. So if you're worried about a child being aggressive, fighting or punching or kicking or doing that sort of thing, and you see them, or they usually come into a group circle or onto the rug in preschool by sliding in and knocking everybody over like bowling pins, if they happen to come over to that rug one day and sit nicely, you want to give attention to that, right? You want to say, I like how nicely you came over and sat on this rug. I am really proud of you. That's exactly what I'm looking for because I'll bet you a million dollars that they get attention every time they slide in there like they're going into a home base, right? Stop, what did you just do? Watch out, right? They're gonna get lots of adult attention for that. So you wanna differentially attend to the opposite so that they get that attention over time for the good stuff. And then contingency management's also helpful too. Having things like token economies or point systems or rewards or, or positive natural consequences that are interwoven into the environment for doing the right thing is, is a really important thing to do, especially kids, for kids with ADHD. So I, that's a lot about time in, right? Time in's got to be reinforcing, rewarding, positive. We want to think real carefully about that when we're using timeout to make sure that that's the case. On the other hand, we have to make sure that timeout is not positive or rewarding. So I'll give you a quick example of a, a child I worked with one time. This was, uh, what, if you have uh, school and maybe some uh, uh, phys ed type activities and you have the pool, for most kids what's going to be their favorite time of the day? The pool, right? Big A plus. All the kids love the swimming pool. So I was working with a kid one time where uh, we, had we were using timeout. You got timeout for aggression or being repeatedly noncompliant or things like that. And we would walk into the pool with all the kids. And as soon as we would step on the, the uh, tile floor of the pool, he would take the kid in front of him and check him as hard as he could into the wall being aggressive. And you get a timeout. I mean, as soon as we stepped on the pool ground, okay, you, that's aggression. You now have a timeout. You have to go sit over here. And it got to the point after two or three days where he would do that to the kid and then walk right over. We didn't even have to tell him that it was a timeout. Well, turns out this was a child that was afraid of swimming. So he learned exactly what you were saying. I can escape something that makes me highly anxious and avoid it by misbehaving. And you know, it was a, a seven-year-old kid. He doesn't have the wherewithal to be able to say, I'm, I'm feeling very afraid right now and uh, my emotions are getting the better of me and I don't want to do it. He can't verbalize any of that, right? He knows as soon as I see that water, I do not like it and there's a way for me to avoid it. And he learned to do that, that very quickly. So we have to make sure that what time, many times when parents tell me timeout doesn't work, I say, oh, when do you use it? Oh, during uh, getting ready for bed, homework, chores. Oh, well, no kidding, right? Because timeout is not reinforcing, it's not timeout from positive reinforcement. It's allowing them to escape or avoid. Sometimes kids will get into timeout to get your attention. If you're running a timeout program, and I know that I can, uh, and, but you're not paying attention to me, you're running your whole group or you're running your whole class or whatever it is, 
I can refuse to do a couple of things. Now you don't have to talk to all those other people. You can start focusing on me, right? And now you have to deal with me and talk to me and put me in this, um, in the chair or in the timeout area. Or I know if I get in timeout, all the kids are going to turn around and laugh at me and snicker at me. And if anybody's been in a grade school classroom, the coin of the realm is peer attention, right? If you can get the other kids to laugh at you through clowning, that's worth more than anything. And, and, and I'll take that, even if there's a cost to me of missing out on maybe some fun activities or something like that. So as professionals, we have to think really carefully about what is driving the kid's behavior. And if they're getting lots of timeouts or doing lots of behaviors that result in timeout, you might think about, are they doing it to escape something like academic work or, or something that's coming up? Are they doing it to avoid something, maybe something they're afraid of or that they dislike a lot? Or are they doing it to get attention because they're not getting that differential attention to alternative behaviors that are positive? Or is the teacher or parent or professional doing everything right, but the, the kids that the child wants to be friends with or that they view as popular laugh at them every time they do something that's really um, uh, related to misbehavior that results in the town. So they're going to keep doing that because they want that attention. So we have to think about how to deal with all those sorts of things. In many cases, for kids with ADHD, you have to do a careful functional assessment about what's driving the behaviors that are resulting in timeout. And sometimes timeout's going to be a good intervention for that. Sometimes it's not the right intervention. You might have to do something else. So timeout's not a silver bullet or a magic wand. You want to use it correctly in situations where it's going to suppress future occurrences of that behavior. Um, so what happens if you have like a rule at home that's like for aggression, there's timeout, and they start hitting during homework time? Would you wait and would you say like when you're done with your homework, you're in timeout, or how would you handle that? That, that's a really good question. So the question is, let's say it's homework time and they start doing things that uh, get them in, into trouble, the result in the timeout, they start hitting or being noncompliant or something like that. And the question is, would you use timeout right then or might you defer it or postpone it until later? There's probably not a one-size-fits-all answer, but your first comment is a logical one. Okay, if right after homework I let you go on TV, watch TV or go outside and play, I might say, well, you have a timeout right now, it's five minutes, you're going to have to go to it after we're done with homework, but you got to finish your homework right now. And, and if you misbehave again, then you might have another timeout that you have to serve. That's usually less effective, though, because if you think about most kids, they live in the now, right? It's hard for them to think what happened five seconds ago, and children do not, most adults don't think about the future at all, right? That's, and kids especially can't do that. So that's something that um, uh, may water down the effectiveness of time. And that's maybe where you think about an alternative um, program, maybe a reward program during uh, homework time where you can earn something positive and use time out more during uh, large group peer interactions or during times that it really is time out from positive reinforcement. Although I'm going to show you some data that suggests time out works just as well for kids with ADHD in classrooms as it does in recreational settings. So it's also going to depend on the child. And before you jump to a really complex program, you might try some things out within the homework situation, see if they work, and if they don't, then move to the next thing. But wouldn't it be confusing for the child if you already have the rule that, like, if you hit, you get time out, but not during homework, you're using something else? Yep. Isn't that yep. consistent? Cert well, the um, overall goal is to suppress behavior, right? You want no hit, everybody wants no hitting to happen. Right. So if you can do that through another way and hitting never comes up, well, then now you don't have to worry about time out for hitting. The only way you know if that's going to happen, though, is to try it. Uh, you could cer it's certainly simpler for a parent to just say, this is our rule, this is the consequence, this is what happens, and, and to try that out. But if it's not working, then you wouldn't keep doing something that's not working for long periods of time. Then you might try something different. Good question. That's, so that's another suggestion. You could remove the child somewhere. If, you, if the child knows they have two hours for free time before dinner time, and you always do homework first, timeout might work in that situation, right? You say, okay, you got a timeout, five minutes. That's eating into your playtime later because you're not going outside until you finish your homework. You got to serve your timeout, five minutes are up, come back and do the homework. Whoops, that's inappropriate. You got another timeout. And now, over time, the child's going to learn that their playtime shrinks the longer it takes for them to do their homework. 
And that's the opposite of what most parents do with kids with ADHD. Most say, you know what, they were working hard all day in school, I want to give them some time to unwind, I want them to relax. They go out and play, then they have a snack, then we have dinner, then we have a shower, then we, have, then we do homework right before bed. We'll talk about the least reinforcing thing for a child in their whole day is going to bed. And we know that because when you say go to bed, they're thirsty, they want to tell you I love you, they, need, they forgot something, right? They will do anything they can to avoid bedtime. That's not timeout's not going to work in that situation. So a parent can take advantage of timeout from positive, reinforce, of timeout from positive reinforcement by using what's called a premac principle or a when-then. You put the least preferred, preferred situation first, and the faster you get that done, the faster you get to the more preferred situation. That's why we all get paid on Friday instead of Monday, right? If we all got paid on Monday, how many of us would show up for Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, right? Our bosses aren't dummies. So they, they know that that's a good way to make sure that people do the behavior that they want. We also know that timeout procedures suppress behavior. So uh, we get timeouts in our cars, right? If you're driving too fast, if you break that rule, you have to pull over and you wait a while and then somebody comes up and, and then it's even worse, you get a, a cost, right? You get a fine. If, if everybody was speeding all the time, we would know that that system doesn't work. But in fact, it does, right? Most people drive the speed limit or seven miles or so over, right? But not really excessive. And, and there's a few people that get pulled over once in a while and then they reduce their speeding behavior, right? Or at least on those streets. And, and then there's a few people where you have to think about different kinds of programs for them because that t simple timeout program of pulling you over and making you wait and giving you a cause doesn't work because they keep speeding over and over and over again. And so for those folks, we do other things, right? We take away their license. We send them to driving school. They, they have lots more different interventions. Same principle is going to hold for kids with ADHD. We hope for many kids timeout's going to suppress their behaviors to the point that they're not doing the sorts of things that are causing them trouble. This was the excellent point made earlier. We do know that, time, that behavior sometimes gets worse before it gets better. And that's an important thing to always tell a teacher, a parent, or a professional that you don't want what... So let's say we're, uh, we have a program for noncompliance, not listening to what adults say, okay? And we're going to start using timeout for that. And the first day we start using that, a child who's been non-compliant, say 10 times per day, gets worse. They're non-compliant 15 times that day. And the adults say, oh my goodness, this is a terrible program, let's stop. What have we just taught that child? <laughs> yeah. Oh, this is simple. I just got to jam the adult up five extra times, and then they back off and things go back to me being able to do what I want to do. Because that ha that, that's very common that that happens, it's called an extinction burst, it's important for parents and teachers to be aware that they have to really stick with things and, and stick through some of the bad times, maybe for a week, maybe for two weeks, in order to make sure that the intervention uh, really doesn't work and that it's not just this child trying to get rid of the demands. So uh, I've seen ch children in our parenting programs that are tantruming for three or four hours, right? Maybe you've seen children that are doing that sort of thing too. I mean, think about the energy it takes to tantrum for three or four hours. That didn't happen overnight. That happened over years and years and years of a parent trying to stop the tantrum. You're not getting this candy. You cannot have this candy. You cannot. I'm exhausted. Here it is. Okay, now that's an hour, right? And then you're not going to your friend's house. You're not going to your friend's house. You're not, I, I'm not doing it. You are not going. I can't take this anymore. I have to go. You can go. Just go. Just stop, right? And literally, that's happening every day for lots of days in a row for years. And you get up to that level, so that's why sometimes kids will buck the system a little bit when you start a program like Time Out, because this has been a strategy that's been successful in the past. It's really important for all of you that are clinicians or those of you working in summer treatment programs or after school programs, before you start a new Time Out intervention, to collect some baseline data. Because if we're talking about a child, it's probably because they're having problems, right? And if you're like anybody else, uh, you, when you're, t you're not at this meeting with all the staff or with the parents or with everybody to talk about everything, right? You're talking about this one problem you're trying to solve, and sometimes problems balloon and become bigger than what they actually are. And so baseline data helps to define what's the extent of this problem. 
It's also going to be helpful later to make sure that we're not getting rid of a program that's actually working. If you have no frame of reference, so maybe if you went from 10 non-compliances a day to seven, the staff might say, well, he's still getting in trouble all the time for not listening. But I would say that's a 30% reduction in non-compliance in a week. That's actually quite remarkable and good. And this child's with us all year. If we can continue to have them reduce their non-compliance by one or two every week, pretty soon it's going to be zero. And that's going to be a positive for this child and for our program or for our classroom. But if we didn't have those baseline data, we might say he's, already, he's still not listening seven times a day. This is not going to work. Let's try something else. So those baseline data are really important. It's hard, hard to do, right? Somebody's got to be responsible for defining what it is we're going to account, it's, uh, uh, keeping track of it, writing it down every day, maybe putting it in a graph. But that helps more than anything else as a clinician in terms of your decision making. I find that to be the most useful thing to look at with parents and teachers as well. Instead of me saying, you know what, we're having all kinds of trouble with your son or daughter hitting or not listening, I'd say, okay, well, we've been keeping track of it. Here's what we're looking at. This is not listening to an adult within five seconds or 10 seconds of them asking to do something. Uh, this is how many times it happens every day. You see some days are better than others, but it's always above 10. We think we need to do something about this. Here's what we would like to do as a plan, and we're going to meet in a week and see whether it worked. And by looking at those data, now it's a team working together to solve a problem. It's not a he said, she said about uh, what's happening with my son or daughter in a different setting. So baseline measures can be very helpful. It'll also help you see if you see the spike in negative behavior that eventually goes down. I always like Mary Poppins' line, well begun is half done. <clears throat> time out, as I mentioned, is a time when we are all super stressed out, right? You, give a, you don't give a time out because you're really happy with the way things are going in your situation. You're going to administer a time out because something went wrong. Somebody broke a rule or somebody's crying because they got hurt or something got destroyed or broken. Because of that, when those behaviors happen, that is, none of us are at our best at dealing with the child's behavior when we're trying to manage it in the moment, right? Because it's rare that we have that one child and we, got, we have all the time in the world to figure out what to do with them. We might have another child who's being aggressive over here. We might have the rest of the uh, group staring at us and we have to make sure the show's going on so that we don't just have a spotlight on this one child and um, you know, not only make them ashamed, but also give them lots of attention for what, what's happening. <clears throat> if you plan ahead, and everybody knows what happens when these behaviors occur, not only the adults, but also the children, that can make a big difference in how well timeouts work for your programs. And so uh, the comment is just to, to really think ahead of time. Uh, a couple times people mentioned consistency is important. This is where consistency happens. It doesn't happen when you're assigning a timeout. It happens when you decide before you're going to use a timeout how it's going to work, not only for me, but for everybody else that might assign a timeout. <clears throat> 